Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. And good evening, friends. Welcome to this Wednesday night, November 4, 2015 edition of Nightcast. Our opening story tonight, friends, the UK has halted all flights between Britain and Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, saying that there is a significant possibility a bomb caused a, the Russian plane crash at the weekend. British holiday makers who are in the resort will be returned to the UK. Foreign Secretary Philip Heyman gave us that news. Flights had earlier been delayed as a precautionary measure after information had, quote, come to light. Russian Airbus 321 crashed on Saturday, killing 222 people on board. Frank Gardner has this opening report. Britain believes it may well have been a bomb that brought down this Russian airliner over Egypt on Saturday, killing all 224 people on board. A statement from 10 Downing Street today said that while we cannot say categorically why it crashed... We have become concerned uh, that the plane uh, may well have been brought down uh, as a result of an explosive device. Safety will always be the priority, and that is why the Prime Minister last night called President Sisi uh, to uh, express uh, concern and to uh, ensure that the tightest possible security arrangements were put in place at Sharm el-Sheikh. The Russian-owned plane, full of returning holidaymakers, left the resort of Sharm el-Sheikh, bound for St. Petersburg. But 22 minutes later, it suddenly fell to earth in the Sinai Peninsula. <laughs> Egypt's President Sisi is due to meet David Cameron in London tomorrow. It's emerged the two men spoke last night to discuss security arrangements at Sharm el-Sheikh airport. Clearly, the British government still has concerns. One possibility being studied is that someone, not a passenger, may have smuggled a bomb through this airport onto the doomed plane. Today, the jihadists of Islamic State Sinai branch claimed, for the second time, that they brought the plane down. Egypt dismissed this as propaganda. But for the thousands of British and other tourists recently arrived in Sham, this latest development will be deeply troubling. British flights home are now on hold, while a team of experts reviews the security at the airport. Their assessment is expected to be completed later tonight. Frank Gardner, BBC News. French passenger Sarah Cotterill and uh, her daughter, she said her, she and her daughter were preparing for a long wait at the airport. I'm Sarah and I'm here with my daughter Abby. We're at Sharm Airport. We were meant to fly back with EasyJet to Gatwick this evening, but our flight's been grounded because of security concerns. We were um, stood in the queue waiting to get on the plane when they told us to move on and sit down because we weren't going anywhere. Going on, you can say. My friend Lauren messaged me saying all the flights grounded, so I went on the news and then they were. And we don't know how long we're going to be stuck here for because nobody's told us anything at all, really. So we just got to sit and wait for the summer. We're definitely going to be here all night. And friends, in, in this uh, next video, Ibrahim Mustafa, a BBC journalist in Sharm who was due to fly back this Saturday, said the picture for visitors was not clear yet. Oh, yes, I think confusion is probably the right word there. I mean, no, I'm still at my resort, obviously, not due to fly back till Saturday. And um, just sort of the atmosphere around here, everyone is sort of checking their phones and checking the Internet and sort of trying to get in touch with the foreign office and their various tours to try and the tour operators, sorry, to try and find out what the situation is. And the new, um, nobody seems to be any the wiser. So, yeah, it just seems a bit uh, confusion, as you say, seems to be raining a bit here. I don't know if you've been in and out of the airport before, but what, what, what are your impressions of security at Sharm el-Sheikh Airport? Well, it's interesting because on Saturday, this Saturday gone as we just flew out, was um, 
obviously it was as the Russian Airbus flow, we, we, we just got breaking news before we boarded our flight about the Russian Airbus, uh, Airbus flight crack, um, the crash. And uh, essentially, there didn't seem to be any sort of panic or anything like that when we landed at the airport. It just seemed to be very much business as usual. And even right now, as where I am, where I'm sat, I'm probably about a mile away from the airport. I'm sort of looking over sort of Shark Bay. I can see where the airport, the vicinity of where the airport is. And I've seen maybe three or four flights since the news broke about an hour or so ago. So I'm guessing um, in terms of security, I can't really comment and say whether it's any different to what it usually is. But it does very much seem as business as usual on Saturday. And as I say, with planes still leaving the airport now, um, not much seems to have changed. And if this does turn out to have been a bomb that brought down the Russian plane, it would be, of course, a disaster for the uh, Egyptian tourist industry, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely, definitely. Um, the, the, where the resort I'm staying at now, it's um, pretty much all English and certainly a lot of Russian and sort of Ukrainian tourists from sort of that region of the world and obviously England as well. So, uh, yeah, if there's any problems with flights between these various nations, then I imagine that people will be very reluctant come back here. Now, friends, uh, near the United States, a volcano in Mexico has erupted, spewing ash and black smoke into the sky. The volcano is located about 50 miles southeast of the capital, Mexico City. Mexico has more than 3,000 volcanoes, but... Our notes here for this news story say that only 14 are considered to be active. I'll let that play in the background just a little bit there as we prepare for the next story. The next story, friends, is going to write, help, uh, kind of summarizes the lesson in history that God has, is allowing mankind to write and allowing man 6,000 years since the Garden of Eden to write the lesson of going its own way after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and cut themselves off from God and all of mankind, cut all of mankind off from their creator and the tree of life to go and make their own laws and decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong. And man is writing a lesson in history as a result of that. This next story from Myanmar will definitely help write the record of man trying to govern himself with, without God. The lesson that God's going to allow man to write is going to be is summarized up as God's apostle for the end time put it as he was teaching us at Ambassador College and said, mankind without God just cannot govern himself. You know, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, around verses 20, 21, he said that if he didn't return at the last possible moment, that mankind would annihilate all mankind, all living things from the face of the earth, man and animals, but he says, for the elect's sake, he will return and stop that and usher in and restore God's kingdom on this earth. More than 90 parties are contesting Myanmar's historic election on Sunday, but only two parties have a realistic chance at forming the next government. The incumbent, military-backed USDP, and Aung San Sue Key's National League for Democracy, NLD. The NLD is expected to win more seats than any other party, but because one quarter of the seats are reserved for the military, it needs to win significantly more than half of those being contested. Jonathan Head visited one of the most important battlegrounds where the USDP party leader is fighting to keep his seat against a surge of support for the opposition. In the farming communities along the Irrawaddy River, life isn't all that different from the days of military rule. And the choice they're being offered in this election is more of the same 
or an entirely fresh start. This is campaign day for the NLD in Hitada, and the town fizzles with excitement. There are no big political names speaking, but people have arrived from surrounding villages to hear a popular band and to bask in the party's heady promise of change. On stage with them is local activist Nguyen Thane. He runs the town's biggest formal clothing shop. Couples come here to buy their wedding costumes. He's unimpressed by the changes that have already happened in his country. They are offering fake change. Here in the rural area, we see that the progress they talk about is fake. People are facing real poverty and limited job opportunities. They are trying to control this country by offering fake development. I found few in this town who would admit to supporting the government's party, the USDP. But this may be deceptive. Ute U is the party's joint chief and the sitting member of parliament. He was born in Hintada, knows it well, and has the resources to campaign in the hundreds of rural villages in his constituency. This all feels less spontaneous, less energetic than the NLD rallies. But that doesn't really matter because the message the governing party is giving to these villagers is that things are going well in Myanmar and that voting for change is too risky. He delivers more of a lecture than an appeal for support. He is, after all, a retired general. Only our party can provide the stability that guarantees economic progress, he says. The audience is more polite than enthusiastic. But after decades of being told what to do, these farmers may find it hard to risk voting for the NLD. It's true. The NLD is well known. But people should vote USDP because all our candidates have a good track record in developing the country. There is trust between us and them. So I believe our party has the best chance of winning. Away from the party organizers, though, the NLD's simple message of hope might be catching on. Mint Tin and her husband are landless farm workers. She had little to say about the election. Yet, without any prompting, she offered her vote to Aung San Suu Kyi's party. Perhaps, in the privacy of the voting booth, many more like her will take a chance on change. John Head, BBC News, in the Irrawaddy Delta. Friends, thousands have joined a march in the Romanian capital, Bucharest, hours after Prime Minister Victor Ponta resigned following a deadly nightclub fire. The protesters, numbering at least 10,000, are demanding early elections and further political reform. Rallies are also said to be taking place in cities across the country. It comes a day after some 20,000 demonstrators spontaneously took to the streets of the capital, angry over the deaths of 32 people in last Friday's fire. Nick Thorpe has this report. The fire that cost 32 young lives was started by fireworks used by a heavy metal band during their stage performance last Friday night. 400 people were in the basement venue at the time. There were only two narrow exits. One was blocked. 130 people are still in hospital, mostly being treated for burns. The first funerals have been held for the victims. On Tuesday night, a nation's mourning turned to anger. Against a political elite, many protesters blamed for endemic corruption. The ease with which permits can be bought for venues unsuited to mass events or to dodge safety regulations. Much of the anger focused on one man, Romania's youthful Prime Minister, Victor Ponta. He's been under pressure to resign for months after Romania's powerful anti-corruption agency brought charges against him. In the wake of the fire, he threw in the towel. I can carry any political battles, but I can't fight with the people. 
This was a tactical retreat by the Social Democrat-led coalition government rather than a surrender. Exactly a year ahead of the next scheduled elections, stepping down now gives the governing parties time to regroup and reorganize. More demonstrations are likely as the crowds keep up the pressure, not just for early elections, but for more responsible government. Nick Thorpe, BBC News. Friends, there are anti-government rallies elsewhere around the world. In this next news story, we'll see how the Maldives president has declared a 30-day state of emergency ahead of a planned government rally. The declaration by President Abdullah Yamin gives security forces their sweeping powers to arrest suspects. In this video... A special outline type video bring you up to up to up to snuff quickly with this. The BBC News examines the chronology of the political crisis in the archipelago. Now, what I'm going to do is, as this rolls, friends, those of you listening via podcast, I'm going to do my best to read the subtitles as as they scroll across. The idyllic archipelago of the Maldives has a troubled political history. 1978 to 2008, Mamoun Abdul Gayoum rules autocratically. 2008, former political prisoner Mohammed Nasheed wins first Democratic polls, ousting Gayoum. In 2012, Nasheed was forced from power in a coup. His deputy took over. In 2013, Abdullah y Yamin Gayoum's half-brother wins office after elections plagued with problems. And bringing us up to date, March 2015, this year, Nasheed imprisoned for 13 years for terrorism, provoking international condemnation. And then in September this year, 2015, there was an explosion on the presidential yacht that left Yamin unharmed, but the first lady was injured. And then, just last month, October 2015, Vice President Amid Adib arrested for alleged involvement in that boat attack of the presidential yacht. Now, this month, the few days we're into this month already, November 2015, President Yamin declares state of emergency. And that's the video outline there prepared by BBC News on that. We've got uh, an outstanding video next, friends, that the BBC has prepared based on Forbes magazine's most powerful people list. And guess who is at the top of that? Let me see if I can roll just a little bit of this in. Oh, okay. Now, that's going to be another one with uh, some music to it. So i got to be careful. Because some of that music is, is, um, carries licensing rights that we don't always have. So I'll have to keep that down under. Vladimir Putin has topped Forbes' list of the most powerful people in the world for the third year in a row. The BBC looks at why the Russian president is number one again and asks who else is up and down in the magazine's global ranking of influencers. This piece is again produced by BBC's and this by BBC's Olivia Lace Evans. And for those watching on the or listening via podcast, I'll try to keep up with the subtitles once again. Let's let her roll. 
Forbes has released its 2015 list of most powerful people. Putin is top again, number one. 2014, Putin was center stage amid Ukrainian crisis. 2015, Russia flexing its muscle in Syria. Obama has been bumped from second place to third place by Angela Merkel, now number two. As the EU struggles with the migration or the migrant crisis, she, Merkel, has become the most powerful woman in the world. Xi Jinping has also slipped to number five from number four. Superpowers are finding it harder to control global events. The tech titans remain influential, but visionary Tesla CEO Elon Musk, number 38, has climbed fastest by gaining 14 places. With a year to the U.S. elections, there are two new names on the list. Donald Trump has made the list for the first time as number 72, it shows here. And Hillary Clinton has returned as number 58. And who will be most powerful? Uh, the question is asked in 2016, and that's where the, the video ends. Now, our closing video tonight, friends, we go to the South China Seas regarding the territorial disputes there, which uh, th will hamper efforts to coordinate urgent action among Asian governments on overfishing, according to the study by the University of British Columbia. If no action is taken fish stocks will decline greatly over the next 30 years, depending on the species the study warns. The study recommended dramatic reduction in all fishing activity, as Juliana reports from Hong Kong. A huge part of the eating culture. No celebration is complete without serving fish, ideally one that was swimming just a few minutes before. People here eat more than 150 pounds of seafood every year. That's more than four times the global average. This insatiable appetite is contributing to intense overfishing. Well, Ho Wahei has been fishing here in the South China Sea for more than 35 years, and he has seen firsthand the effects of unsustainable practices. <laughs> The number of fishing boats in the South China Sea has jumped from 70,000 to 700,000. It's 10 times more than it used to be, so it is a huge change. Mainland China's economy has taken off, and a lot of Chinese fishermen go to the South China Sea for fishing now. How has that affected the fish? There are more boats, so of course there's less fish stock, and each fisherman has less catch. Sustainable fishing practices are better, because there will be fishing for everyone in the future. In some countries, small fish are not allowed to be taken, and this can stop overfishing. A study by the University of British Columbia estimates that if no action is taken, the price of shrimp will become more than three times more expensive in the next three decades. Popular fish like tuna and mackerel will be six times pricier, and garupa will command nine times the price it costs today. So what has to be done now to tackle the problem of overfishing? So this is a critical issue, and the governments in the region really need to work together to manage their fisheries. There's over three million people a day who make their livelihoods on fishing, and all of this will be gone if we do not manage this properly. There will be serious 
social and economic consequences in the region if we don't manage it well. And friends, that's it for this Wednesday night report. God willing and the creek don't rise. We'll be back again tomorrow night, Thursday night, with today's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying so long and good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.